Goedemiddag, dames en heren. Welkom terug. Kom gerust een beetje dichter als u daar in de verte staat te luisteren. Ik mag Erika Vatland aan u voorstellen, dames en heren, voor het tweede gesprek in onze Cosmic Collection reeks. En heel benieuwd wat Erika gaat toevoegen aan onze ruimtesonde, waarin alleen het allerbeste van de mensheid de ruimte ingeschoten mag worden. Welkom Erika Vatland. Dank je. You're a Norwegian writer and anthropologist. Uh, you speak seven languages uh, and you used to live in uh, many different countries. What languages do you speak? Well, I, I don't speak Dutch, unfortunately, but it's very similar to Norwegian, so I can understand a lot. Um, I speak well English, obviously, Norwegian, French, Spanish, Italian, Russian, and German, and now I'm learning Hindi and Arabic. It's a virus. <laughs> it's a, yeah. But I don't do much else. I, I'm not knitting or doing anything useful. So whenever I want to relax and have fun, I find the grammar book and I start reading. Really? And if you know already so many languages, is, it, is the process faster? It depends. If it's a language, that's similar to another one, like Italian, it's very similar to Spanish, which is both an advantage, but it can also make you oh, mix Mixed them. Up, yeah. um, but then, if it's a totally new language that doesn't belong to the same language family, like Arabic, you really start at zero. Maybe you have some routines and in, in learning a language, but still you have very little help from the others. Okay, and what language is still on your list? Uh, I would very much like to learn uh, Old Greek, but I've decided that I will do that when I'm a pensioner and have uh, more time. Okay, you're here in Brussels uh, for how many weeks now? I've been here since the 6th of March and I'm staying until the 2nd of May, so I've been giving a residency uh, from Passaporta. And that is just brilliant, and I love being here. I love being away from my husband and my dog, so I can focus 100% uh, on my writing. I'm very busy now, because my next book is to be published in October. And please don't ask me how much is left. <laughs> <laughs> is that the best thing that can happen to a writer, isolation in Brussels? Well, it's very high up on the list. Okay. Um, your last book, Sovietistan, is a travel book. It is. And uh, you analyze societies of fascinating Central Asian countries like Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. That's true. Those and why, far away Istans. Yes, and why should we read your book? Can you say that in just only a few phrases before we uh, choose your items to put into this Yeah, plate. I could spend the next 15 minutes talking about my book, but I won't. But You will do that <laughs> later tonight at 6.30 in the Martin, in the Spiegelzaal. Yeah, then we have an hour. Um, well, if you want to know more, if you are curious about Central Asia, either if you're planning to go there yourself or you just want to travel from your armchair and learn something about those extremely fascinating countries, Central Asia, well, you should read Sovietistan, and you don't have much choice because it's the only book about those countries. Okay. Later this evening, you have a conversation with Jeroen Teunissen about the book in uh, the Martin in the Spiegelzaal. Dus als u daar meer over wil weten, dat enige boek wat daarover bestaat, dan moet u daar sowieso naartoe straks. Uh. For your contribution to our cosmic collection, you chose the books of Svetlana Alexievich. Yes. Erika. They form a cycle. Five books? Yes, in total. And the cycle is called Voices from Big Utopia. Yes, Voices of Utopia. I'm not 100% sure about the English title. Okay. Does it make sense to talk about all of them together? Shall we put them all at once in the probe? Uh, I think we have to put them all together. And, um, well, there were so many books I could have picked, and really, it is an impossible task to just pick one. So, uh, at least I did pick five. Um, but I decided just to pick the books of the author that recently made the deepest impression on me. I discovered you see a her books. Of her yes. Over there. <laughs> I think that must have been when she visited uh, Afghanistan as part of the research for. 
uh, boys of zinc or zinky boys as it's called in english and it's about the soviet afghan war and her books were until recently quite little known in the west and it's only a few years ago since they were translated to norwegian so that's when i discovered her books and then she in 2015 she well deservedly was the first writer from belarus to win the nobel prize of literature and even she considers herself a novelist, but I would also say that you could say that she is the first non-fiction writer to win the Nobel Prize of Literature. Okay, we launch a probe into the furthest regions of space and we take only the best on board. And why is that Voices from Big Utopia? Well, I picked them because I was so fascinated by her books and I saw this as a great opportunity to talk about her books for 15 minutes. And um, it's very rare that you read a book that changes both the way you see the world and the way you see literature, that is something new, something you really haven't read before. And her style is very particular. For every book, she does very, very good uh, and long research. She usually does for every book about 1,000 interviews. And then in the book, there will be about maybe 20% of all those interviews will be in the book. And then the author herself, she's not present. So it's only the voices of the people that she's talking to that you can read. So you read their stories. And I think that's why those five books are called Voices of Utopia. And she has made it her like life project to describe the Soviet people and their experiences. Yeah, and it's uh, like an emotional history she writes down. Yeah, she says herself that she's a historian of the soul and that she writes the stories of ordinary, normal people. But the stories that she finds, and this is, of course, because she's talking with people who were born in the Soviet Union and many of them had very dramatic lives. So. The stories are extremely dramatic and they can also be very sad and moving, so I would not recommend to read all the books at once, uh, like I did. It's like a living history told by the people themselves. It is. Um, the first book that I read, it was her third book, it was published in Russian, so she's Belarusian, but she writes in Russian. Do we have to read them in the right order? No, 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 you don't. You can start with whichever book uh, you like. And so I started with the book that I just have to check the English title. It's called Chernobyl Prayer, A Chronicle of the Future. And it was published 1997, so 11 years after the Chernobyl disaster. And the Chernobyl disaster affected Ukraine, but also Belarus a lot. And I have myself, I have visited Chernobyl twice. And, but when you're walking around there, it's a very special place, of course. And of course, you're anxious about radiation. Um, but there are so many tourists going there now, almost 20,000 every year. And well, you will see all those deserted houses. And it's, it's a strange place. But still, it doesn't really, just being in Chernobyl doesn't really give you an idea of the disaster that took place in 1986. But reading the book, uh, Chernobyl Prayer, where she has interviewed then people who lived in Chernobyl, who lost their husbands in Chernobyl, who experienced this tragedy themselves, then it all becomes very, very real. And she tells those most tear-dripping stories. And it, it can be very difficult to read them. For instance, I remember one, it's about I'll just check the name. It's about a woman, Yudmila, and she's very much in love with her husband, Vasily, and he's a firefighter. And of course, the firefighters that went to Chernobyl as the first firefighters, they did not live for long afterwards, and they died very painful deaths of radiation. And so they were sent to Moscow, and she was, of course, not allowed to visit him. Uh, but she did visit them anyway because uh, the love was so strong and no one at that time really understood how dangerous radiation was and how contagious it was. 
and she didn't tell anyone at the hospital that she was six months pregnant. Because of then, of course, they would have kept her away with force. But she, in the night, she snuck into her husband's hospital room and visited him and spent the last days with him as he died a very painful death. And then afterwards, she survives actually, but her daughter dies uh, very shortly after birth because all the radiation was absorbed by, by the fetus. So it's those very tragic stories, but still it's also a very powerful love story. Yeah, she's writing on a new book now, eh? She is, and I that will be a book about, about love. It's about love, eh? yeah. What, what does she say about it? love is what brings us into this world, I want to love people. Yes, and that you can see in all of her books, really, that there are very, you will find a lot of very passionate and strong love stories, and to sum it up, you can say that, that you will find a lot of passion in all those stories, and I think that is because Russian people and the, the Soviet people, they are very passionate people. You have these very strong feelings that you also will find in other Russian literature. Okay, she writes about reality, just like you do in your books. There's no fiction at all involved, but she shows reality with her own view, can I say that? Um, but Well, she doesn't really, because she's not present in the text. Of course, she's editing the interviews, but the only thing that you will find in the books is actually the voices of the people themselves. So she has been searching for the voices that she finds strong enough to be in the book. But then it's only the voices of the people, and it's also... Well, it must be a nightmare for the translators because there are so many different voices, academics, housewives, uh, gardeners, and so on. And the book, the first book she read, was she wrote, it was called, um, and in English it's called, Wars, Unwomanly Face. In Russian it's called, translated, The War Has No Womanly Face. And it's uh, a war where she tells, and she only interviewed women. And she made women tell about their stories from the Second World War. Because in, especially in the Red Army, um, well, hundreds of thousands of women also participated. But their stories had never been told. When you read war stories, it's usually told by men, and it's about battles and weapons and so on. So she... Um, interviewed, I think, 1,000 women about their experiences at the front uh, in, the, in the Second World War, which was very dramatic for the Soviet Union. More and what than are 20 those stories people. about? Sorry? And what are those stories about? Yeah, I found out. It was 20 million people who died. And, but 20 million people, that is only a number. But then when you read her book, you start to realize what it was like, how terrible it was. Because those women, they describe not only weapons and battles, but also feelings and colors and the blood next to spring flowers. So it suddenly became so very, very real. And often these women had never told their stories before. No one had asked them. And after the war, it became shameful to have been a soldier, a woman soldier, because women were supposed to give birth, not kill. Um, so many of them never married, and they didn't talk about this until Svetlana Alexievich came 40 years later and made them talk. And they were so, it was painful, but also they were so grateful that someone finally wanted to hear their stories. And she took Svetlana Alexievich two years to find the publisher in the Soviet Union that would publish her book, because they all said, well, this is not how we talk about the great patriotic war. Uh, and then she finally did find the publisher. The book was published in 1985, and it became a huge success. It's, she sold two million books in the Soviet Union. Yeah, she gave those women a voice, actually. Is she a role model, Erika? Is Sorry? she a role model? Well, I'm a huge fan of her books, but I... I would never copy her because I think as an author you have to find your own voice and your own way to write. Um, but I warmly recommend everyone to read it. 
um, both if you want to understand the Soviet people, how they were thinking, but I think also her books, it's, um, it gives you insight to understand Russia today by understanding their very special history. Okay, thank you very much, Erika Fatland. Voices from Big Utopia, een aanrader dus voor uh, al wie wat dieper in dit onderwerp uh, wil duiken. Svetlana Alexievich, een naam om zeker en vast uh, te onthouden. Thank you very much, Erika Fatland. Thanks for being here. Thanks for your contribution to our Cosmic Collection.